guess I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I, I'm Amy Hendrickson. I'm the executive director of the Wyoming Wool Growers Association. Some of you already know me because I see some of our members here. Um, one thing I always like to do is say that just because we set, we are called the Wool Growers doesn't mean that all we do is wool. We do represent all sheep uh, production in the state, uh, whether it's lamb or um, wool. Uh, there are also at least one um, uh, milk producer that I know, very small, up in Sheridan that I've heard of. So technically, I suppose we represent that <laughs> uh, group too, although they don't. They're not. In addition, um, we are also very aware that the goat, um, that goats are becoming extremely popular and their numbers are growing in this state. Um, and so while we don't do a lot with goats, we, are, uh, we do have connections um, and can answer questions um, and or primarily put um, goat producers in um, touch with uh, people who can help them in their production. Uh, I'm going to start um, to talk about the lamb market, um, the current lamb market. Um, you know, COVID had its impact this time last year. We were going, we were doing really well, and then it all came to a crashing halt in March. Um, and in that first two weeks of the crisis, it, it was really hard. Um, our lamb process suffered huge market losses, some of which we still haven't gotten back. Uh, one recently, one. A uh, major processor said they lost 50% 50, 50 of their markets in the first two weeks. Um, another processor uh, went out of business as a result of it. Um, and um, that was, that really, that there um, what had a tremendous impact on our prices. But since August, we've had two new plants come online. Um, and that has helped a lot. And our prices are going up. Their prices are more are um, uh, pretty solid uh, right now um, and uh, but you know how long that goes one of the things uh, we do not have the fine dining one of the things that we lost was the fine dining there and that some of that will come back I don't know how much of it will come back because a good deal of our product was sold to um, uh, uh, cruise lines and so when who knows when cruise lines will be going and stuff. So um, while our prices are pretty good right now, um, there is potential for it to go, to get better, but um, uh, you know, we just don't really know what the future holds there. Um, one of the things that we have seen though is that a, a greater direct to market or direct to consumer um, sales. Uh, so that, I mean, I think that's beneficial. The problem is, is that where do you get them processed? Because uh, that has also had an impact is that the small processor just can't meet that need. Um, and then um, the other thing that we have seen is that as um, consumers are at home, they're becoming more interested in preparing their own meals and they're becoming, you know, in the beginning there was a thought that it was always, it was just going to be hamburgers and hot dogs and stuff, but as this goes on, they're becoming more um, interested in, in trying different uh, foods that they hadn't prepared before and also more complicated recipes and lamb seems to fall into that fairly well. Um, you know, our concerns always remain uh, with the um, with imports, uh, currently the estimate um, 55 to 60 percent of all lamb consumed in the U.S. is uh, imported. Um, although I'm not necessarily sure where that non-traditional lamb market falls into that because that's not really captured in those numbers. Um, and certainly that's where we're seeing the highest prices right now uh, for lamb. But um, the recently, right at the end of the last administration, they pushed for pushed a, a rule out of uh, USDA uh, called the Scrapey Import Rule um, that will make it. Uh, the sheep industry has asked that before that rule goes anywhere, um, that it, we should uh, secure more export markets for our lamb. Uh, however, they for whatever reason, push that forward. And what that will do is make it easier to bring um, sheep, uh, both live and the sheep products, um, into the US from uh, countries like uh, Canada and the UK. 
and, uh, and elsewhere. So there is some concern over that because it does, um, we got scrapie in the US in um, 1947 out of a sheep, uh, some sheep that came out of Canada. Uh, the sheep originated in the UK um, because of, because they're part of the Commonwealth. So, um, they were able to, to move those animals freely between those two countries. And even though Canada didn't have scrapie, uh, they were able to bring those animals in and then they came to the US and that's how we got scrapie. And you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars later, we're almost to the point of having um, scrapie eradicated from the U.S. So um, it does create um, an animal health concern there also. Uh, so I'm going to move now to the wool market. Um, 2020 really saw the collapse of the wool market. It just completely collapsed. Um, it was already in a rocky place because of the trade disputes with China. Um, but when the COVID pandemic hit, uh, it just was the nail in the coffin. And it's because wool is such an international commodity. So uh, the fact is, is that wool wasn't being, um, there was no demand anywhere in the world for wool because everybody was at home. Everybody was in their PJs uh, rather than their wool suit and um, their wool coats and things. Uh, again, after August, we started to see some of those prices recuperate um, or recover. Uh, and um, last week, we saw a nice jump in the wool uh, prices. Um, and the good news is Wyoming's wool is really well suited for a good recovery because we have really good quality wool here, uh, quality wool that's a result of a long hit of uh, producers who have a long history of producing wool. They provide, uh, they have good you know, genetics and they provide good quality nutrition for the, and care for their animals. Um, plus the environment that these animals are raised in means that we have uh, less um, uh, contamination of the wool. And so that means that we don't have as much sorting afterwards uh, and, and all. The drought though, uh, as our prices, you know, although we're poised to see our prices increase, um, from what I'm told by some of the wool buyers that it's likely not to move as um, as quickly as it could just simply because of the drought, which means that the um, wool fleeces will be uh, dirtier. There'll be more dust in, and dirt in them, uh, which then requires longer processing. Uh, but, that, but still, as far as overall, uh, Wyoming really does uh, look like we're sitting in a good place for the wool recovery. That being said, we also have people who have as much as two years, at least one, some people have two years of wool in storage. Uh, so that also will hamper um, the price a bit. Um, so uh, um, most of last year, from, the, from our perspective, all we worked on was trying to get some um, financial relief for our producers who were, um, you know, in such a, both our wool producers and our lamb producers who were faced with um, an economic situation, um, uh, very undeserved, uh, uh, but also a crisis situation in terms of their, their industry. And um, we were able successfully to get um, sheep included in the uh, COVID relief um, packages. The first time, however, it was not, it was really, it didn't, wasn't very much, but, the, but it, we worked and got through in the second one, the $27 a head that our producers were able to get. And, uh, I worked very closely with ASI on that um, there, and so that was good. At the state level, uh, we were able to ensure that sheep were included in the uh, state uh, economic package. Um, however, uh, it, you know, one of the problems of doing things in a rush is that you put things in and you're not really sure what that means uh, once the legislation gets passed and the way that the AG um, interpreted some of it kind of put some uh, sideboards on the program to the point that uh, for a lot of producers it just didn't, they just felt that they couldn't, uh, they couldn't, um, they just didn't fit into it. So um, the, our legislat 
legislators and our state officials are certainly aware of where those problems were, uh, and they are right now negotiating new, um, um, a new package uh, for to use that remaining 80, there's about, about $80 million that was supposed to be spent on agriculture that didn't get used, and uh, they, are gonna, they are working to try to get that money to stay with agriculture and create a program that can still benefit our producers as we go through, you know, we continue with this COVID. Um, so speaking of the legislature, um, I'm gonna switch to another favorite topic of sheep producers, uh, predators. Um, I, I've been working on predators a lot lately. Uh, but in 2020, we were successful in getting an additional million dollars um, uh, into the budget for the Animal Damage Management Board. Uh, however, what the Lord gives, he takes away. And because of the COVID economy, they're taking it all away. Nice. So, <laughs> but the good news is, is if we hadn't had it, they'd have taken from the base of what we had before and that would have been even harder on us. And so um, we, having had that buffer helps a lot. Um, and hopefully we'll be, I just can't say what the future holds there though, because this administration, this new administration is, you know, with every stroke of the pen, doing more to um, undercut our economy in Wyoming. And so I have no idea what the future will hold in, in that regard. Um, so, uh, one of the other areas that we've been working on, I asked, there, I was in the predator man management um, session earlier and I asked what, about the eagles, in, uh, whether in Fremont County you see a lot of issues with eagles and they said that there are some. But in some, in the states, there are some places that it's really bad. I have one producer who lost 55% of their um, ewe lambs to, um, to, and they can they can show it. They can demonstrate it and everything. Um, and uh, for that reason, he was able to get a, uh, a permit to re to uh, relocate and to harass. Uh, he was the first producer in ten years to get such a permit. And and as there are they are allowed. So for uh, eaglers are allowed to have take six, up to six eagles a year out of, um, off of, um, you know, into captivity. And uh, they're golden eagles, not bald eagles. Uh, and uh, out of the six permits, five of them were in Wyoming. So, um, and mostly in the Southwest. Uh, this year, there's lots and lots of people. They, they all send me copies of the permit applications. And so we've had a lot of requests there. Uh, just to harass because eagles are a huge issue um, here, and it's and the ability to the, just doing what they've done. They've had uh, professionals come in, talk with them about the eagle um, habits, the eagle, uh, what how eagles predate and everything. And they made some changes in the, this in this particular ranch. Made changes in their uh, operation changed pastures, different things at different times of year, and it has actually reduced, really helped reduce it, and it's all been done in a non-lethal way. And uh, so, um, you know, that partnership between the Wyoming Game and Fish, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and uh, wildlife services in the industry has been really good. Um, however, there's always somebody out there who's trying to stop it all, and so that's, we're working on that too. There's been people trying to, that are actually out there saying things that are simply not true, big surprise. Um, but, uh, so we continue to, you know, we continue to fight for that ability to, to um, you know, protect our livestock um, and our way of life, actually. So, um, I don't know where we are on this. We are 20 minutes in. Um, one of the other things that the wool growers does is that we um, try to promote our industry in uh, lots of different ways, but also we uh, try, we work hard to uh, preserve the history of, uh, of our industry uh, and also uh, share uh, the value of it with the general public. Those people, you know, we tend to talk to ourselves, you know, 
to people who understand it, but we also have an obligation to make sure that the public understands how important the sheep industry is, not only uh, its history to Wyoming and to Wyoming, um, uh, history, uh, to Wyoming's economy and its history and its culture. Um, I have a, there's a sign when you walk in the into the building of the Wyoming wool growers and it says, it's this big sign, it has a, it says, Sheepmen build the built the land, and it's a reminder that it is through the um, the improvements that sheep ranchers and sheep producers have made to our um, environment and our um, landscape that is made that you know a lot of the ability to just to live and produce um, livestock here um, possible. But it's also made a good um, environment for our wildlife for the state. And so that's part of what our responsibility at the wool growers is, is to try and make sure that um, we uh, share that share those impacts, those positive impacts. Um, one of the things that we did, uh, the Vern and Vivian family out of um, the out of uh, Carbon County had donated to the Wyoming wool growers a sheep wagon, a, a James Can Candlish sheep wagon and um, uh, it was fully restored and we've had it, we've pulled it out, we've had it down in Douglas and we pulled it out every year at the state fair to show it. Um, but the family really wanted it to go someplace where it could be used to teach people about the, sheep, the history of the sheep industry, in, um, not just in Wyoming, but anywhere. So um, the Little Snake River Museum in Savory, Wyoming um, was donated several sheep wagons, and they uh, secured a $150,000 grant to build a building and have a center uh, that's dedicated to the history of the sheep industry. And they, um, they we worked out to loan them our, um, our wagon, and so it's on display down there. We went down, I have to give uh, thanks to Ivan and his, and uh, uh, Glenda, and how, that they helped, because they hauled our sheep wagon from Douglas um, to Lander than to Sa uh, Savory, um, and but they had an open house last August, and little tiny Savory, which I think has a population of six or twelve people, had over two hundred people at the museum. It was amazing, and uh, I was only there for one day, but uh, Ivan got to spend a lot of time there. Uh, so we're really excited to have the wagon there, um, and I have a I have a photograph. And I uh, hear that Ivan took. And um, in the back, you'll also see a wool wagon. Well, Sam Hansen out of Tennessee donated that wool wagon to the Wyoming Wool Growers, so we sent it there also. And uh, so we're excited about that to be able to um, to uh, give that. Uh, we're excited to be able to do that. Uh, do those kinds of things. We are also um, in the uh, throes of developing the Wyoming Sheep Foundation. Um, the foundation is, is will be dedicated to education um, and extension and um, preservation of the sheep industry history um, for this for the state. And uh, we have uh, we are meeting. I think the week after next to um, approve the bylaws and the articles of incorporation, we've got our EIN, and so um, we're going on there. It is a separate organization um, from the Wyoming Wool Growers. Um, SHEEP stands for uh, Sheep History, Sheep Heritage, Education, and Extension, um, and promo or Promotion, something like that. I can't remember. I had it all written out, and I knew I would forget. But anyway, so that's there. Um, now, I also wanted to take a minute, you know, I've been talking about what we do and all, but one of the things that I get probably asked the most about is, you know, how can we promote our industry? What can we do? And one of the things we've been really working on, there's a, um, uh, so in the state legislature, there's a, there's a two meat processing bills that are going through. One of them would um, create a program. Uh, really, it doesn't necessarily create a program. It just formalizes what the Wyoming Business Council is doing and also the Department of Ag 
is doing to help promote uh, Wyoming agriculture. Um, but in this case, uh, the meat industry here, the, the um, uh, meat production, which includes the sheep, the lamb industry, of course, and um, and, and I I'm really excited about that, and we really and I think that it's really important that we as a state, was something we've been saying for a long time, is that we have a very solid um, agriculture community here, an agriculture economy here is the third largest uh, segment of our state's economy, and yet always when they talk about diversifying the economy and strengthening the economy and stuff, they look outside of what we already have. This one actually takes what we have and builds on, on it and makes it stronger. And so that's one of the things that we've been working on. Um, and, uh, but, so one of the things I was thinking about this is that how can we as individuals, how you as producers, be your, you know, be your marketer. Um, and I came up with the idea of a, the two-minute market, two-minute marketing um, advertisement. Uh, and it's it comes from little things like uh, one day I was, uh, I play tennis. I love playing tennis, right? And uh, I was sitting there and one of the guy, one of the people we were playing tennis with was complaining because his socks were so, he did, just didn't like his socks. I said, you should wear wool socks. They wick away um, the moisture. You'll be much more comfortable. And then somebody else said, that's all I wear. And then we got into this big conversation. And now, like, three people said, well, I'm going out to buy wool socks. It took two minutes to do that. But I took, I, it was that one opportunity to take advantage of it. I was uh, out to dinner. Not a lot of people go out to dinner anymore, but I do. And we were, it was in December, and uh, the uh, Silver Fox uh, in um, uh, Casper uh, was doing a lamb special all of November, I mean all of December. And uh, so I ordered it, but it was New Zealand lamb. And that's always a quandary for me because I don't really want to support New Zealand lamb. But on the other hand, I want the restaurant to know that I want lamb. So I did that. Well, it was a special, right? So they gave me this little card that said, tell me about your dinner. So I said it was really good, except it was New Zealand lamb. And by the way, if you want local grown lamb, Wyoming grown lamb, you can get it from lambguys.com. Two minutes, right? So it's just taking advantage of those seconds uh, there, um, to, of those things to just say, hey, you can do this. And so in order for me to do that, one of the things is I need to know who has um, their own, who has their products that they want to have marketed, because I can always say, hey, you know, I know, well, do you know anybody in, you know, near Riverton? Well, you know, yeah, here's the name. Um, I was at a, a thing at the, at the Mountain Meadow Wool Mill one time, and I had um, a person from one of the guest ranches nearby come up and talk to me about how much, this was a few years ago, so Mountain State Frozen was still there, and how much they love Mountain State Frozen, and the fact that they could get Wyoming lamb, you know, the American lamb and stuff, and it's great. And then that person moved on, and another person from a different um, guest ranch came up and said, I just can't find American lamb anywhere. <laughs> like, how in the same place can that be the case? You know, so... Uh, so anything that, if you know of restaurants that serve lamb, if you know anything like that, if you provide that information to me, then we can, you know, help get that, get um, uh, information out and and draw and um, either direct people that way or at least let people know that it's that um, it's available. So um, I think that's it. I can answer any questions anybody has. I think we're we're at twelve. Uh, 11.30 now, so is there any questions? Did, was I wrong on anything, Marvin? Oh, the price no. The price is going <laughs> Well, they do change, I have to say. So, yeah, I think that it's, you know, it depends on the weight, obviously. Yeah. What, what about the state program now with the COVID money? Is, are you redoing the whole thing? Well, um... Because I couldn't make the first one work at all. For me. Yeah, yeah, nobody. No, to be real honest, very few people could. Uh, some people could, but um, very few. And, and like, you know, the thing that was difficult was you had, 
like Nebraska just gave out wholesale subsidies. I mean, they just wrote checks to producers, and I don't even know how much you had to show you were involved in it. Uh, Montana did that, but they weren't going to let us do that in the state of Wyoming. And, and uh, it, they, you had to prove that your losses, the, the biggest problem was you had to prove your losses were due to COVID. And, um, but for a lot of people, and I think you're probably different, uh, to some extent, you should have been able to, like your expenses, the ex extraordinary expenses. So you had, um, so normally you would send your um, lambs to, you know, just, um, this is probably not in Wyoming the case, but let's say you would send, normally send lambs in March to um, uh, slaughter, uh, but you couldn't until uh, August. And all that fee, well, that's a long time, I guess, maybe July, but it, all that fee would be considered an extraordinary expense that was a COVID expense. And so that could be, um, could be uh, included. The problem is, is that if you would have any money from the federal government program, then you had to deduct that. And the reason for that is you can't double dip. Right? It's all coming from the same pot of money. So you can't, you know, this hand take money out and then with this hand take money out of the same pot. And so that's what, but um, the way that they structured it, it just didn't, it didn't, it just didn't make sense unless people fit. And, you know, uh, one thing I'm really proud of our people, for the most part, our people are like, no, I'm not, I'm not taking a chance that they're gonna come back and ask for that money back. So they said, no, we're not going to do it. And so for the most part, couldn't do it. Now, they are fully aware of what those issues are. We did try at the, uh, before the end of the year, all the money was supposed to have been spent by the end of the year. Um, but they, it got, um, that got, I think, with the new package that you didn't have to do that. Um, and so that's why we still have the $80 million. Um, you know, we did try to find ways to use it, but we just couldn't make it work. But I think those ideas that were more beneficial to producers are still on the table for how that works. And there's more time for this legislature to look at the language of how they're going to structure it so that we can do more with it. Uh, but, uh, you know, as those, uh, so, one of the problems is, is that the, it, like in, we've got two new members of the um, House Ag Committee who are like, we can't spend money at all, you know, and so they, even though the money's already there and it's not state money, they were like, no, we're gonna kill it, you know, we're not gonna do this. And so, you know, they were able to kind of uh, table it and have, so that allows them to have their discussions behind the scenes and everything. But it, um, it's a there's a lot of there's the un, it, there's a lot of uncertainty as to how this is going to come out in the end. And so we're in the midst of it. But I don't know if I answered your question, but I'm fine. Yeah, Amy. Uh, in Marvin's regard, it was seamless for me. Oh, for the no. two programs that I went into as an operator with lambs and such and getting the wind of what they were, it was seamless for me. Uh, and you know, of course. seamless for me let's see what it does you know for sheep and of course like you said it's all to do with when you own them in the window that you own them when you shear them you know that and all of them windows fit fine for me and so it was seamless it it took me all of maybe the two times i was down here less than a half hour to to uh, get that so right. you know in some well, in cases yeah, yeah. the wool part of that yeah. It was. It's yeah. Well, and they were what they were trying to do was they were trying to use words so that um, it would meet the law, um, but they were willing to work with people. Um, and uh, but you know, it it was 
hard to read. It was hard to understand. It was hard to figure out where you fit into it. Um, and because they were talking about, with the, well, they considered, um, they considered, they talked about labor and stuff. Well, that wasn't really the issue for us, you know, right? But it, what they were trying to say is that's the area for your extraordinary expenses, like perhaps you had to store it, or perhaps where your normal cost to ship it was um, a certain amount, but because there was a limited access to transportation, your prices went up, so then that difference could be included. But it was so unclear um, there, and that's why I kept saying, talk to the, call the call them, talk to them, try to figure it out. But they, but they said in the end that a lot of producers couldn't, just couldn't make it work. Well, they weren't comfortable with the way that they, were, they would have to go about doing it. So, and I think that's, I think that's wise. And I think it was disappointing for the, um, um, for the leaders who tried to make all that happen, but it's because of, it was simply because of the way it was, well, and there was a big fight between the governor's office and the legislature over it too. There was a, some big battles about that too, about the way it was interpreted and, and everything. But you know, that's just, unfortunately, that's what happened. And that's why they had, well, even with at the federal level, they had to go back to the drawing board and make some changes. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had anything from the federal government. But it also did help uh, the uh, USDA programs, really. They did a lot to try to help um, the industry and prove that, um, the, you know, prove those programs also. So, uh, you know, the, the good news is the sheep were included, which they have, for the most, traditionally are not, have not been included. So that was good news. So, but sorry. I don't usually, I'm like, I, I don't usually play in the government program. Right. This year we didn't have a choice. Right. Yeah, exactly. We got hammered so hard. Right. And the good news is with the last, um, with the last package that went through, um, the, um, and there is more money and, um, that's supposed to come out from USDA, a new program. And, the, and also the other thing, the USDA did do some, um, protein purchases from the sheep industry. And interestingly, the cattle industry said they didn't want it because they felt that it actually would keep the prices down longer um, if they did it. So, um, but for the sheep industry, that was the first time, I think a long time that they bought, uh, they even bought racks, which was an unusual, um, an unusual cut to buy. Um, but one of the th good things that came out of this last package is that the um, payments are done are not taxable. And I'm getting a confirmation on that, but that's what I, my understanding is that they're not taxable. So that's good because, you know, they destroy the economy, give you money, and then tax you more <laughs> for it. Is that all the payments or just this next package? No, it's for the, it's for the payments that have been made. So I was gonna, I actually sent a text to our treasurer to make sure that's true. She is not responding, so. But that's, that's my. That's what I understand. That's my understanding, and, not, and you know, I know that there has been some. I'm not a tax advisor, so I'm trying to be a tax accountant. But that's my. That was what the last I had read was that the, the payments are not taxable. So, and that includes your stimulus. You know, the check that you, you know, the IRS check that everybody got, um, except us. I don't know, I, my husband asked me about this event. I said, I thought you got it. Got it, yes. <laughs> so, so we hadn't got it. <laughs> so, but anything else? Any other questions? So one thing that you said we need to talk about sign about the land prices are good. They're super encouraging right now. Can you shed light on why that is? I mean, our producers are always waiting for the next ball to drop. <laughs> well, I think that um, we have to look at the market for it. It's really the non-traditional market that the, the prices are the highest. Would you agree with that statement, Marvin? Yeah, the lighter weight. Yeah, the lighter weight. And I, and, uh, 
I think that that is um, more a, I think that th that reflects that direct to, to consumer um, uh, increase that we've seen. Uh, in some of our surrounding states, the, the direct to consumer um, sales have really, is really what has saved a lot of producers because they were able to, to, um, to find a place for it. Now, the, you know, as I said, getting that processed is a bit more difficult, but. Um, and is that something you would have been able to estimate in the business? Well, that's certainly a, a yeah, that's certainly a, a part of that non-traditional. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, now, at the American Sheep Industry Association meeting last week, there was an interesting comment that I found um, that was mentioned, and that is, is that as a new generation, so you have the first generation of these um, ethnic um, communities that have come in where lamb is extremely important to them, but they want it halal, uh, processed according to halal, but they don't trust the um, halal processing in the, make, in the large processing plants. But the second generation is le has less concern over it. So that, to me, is an interesting thing uh, there. But um, I think that the primary thing is the, is the demand, ethnic demand. So will that likely hold as a trend? Okay. I don't know. They're just starting to see a little bit of that. So That's what I'm interested in. The numbers are yeah. too high right now to be successful. Right. Legitimate market. Right. Well, you know, the interesting thing about it is, is that lamb was enjoying a, a, a surge in popularity and interest. Um, and I don't think that went away just because the thing is is that where most people would have encountered lamb was in a restaurant or on a cruise ship, you know, or something like that. And then they might be willing to try it. Then. Well, the people aren't going out. But now they're looking at um, their, they're just looking to try something new and different. And, uh, and so I think that there could actually be a consumer interest in, in lamb that could be sustainable because, you know, if they're, as long as they're preparing it, you know, in a way that they enjoy it, um, but it's, you know, it's expensive, but it's not, to buy it in a grocery store is not as expensive as it, as it would have been to go and buy four lamb meals, right? You can buy lamb for the family at less than you could, probably at the same amount as you might be able to buy uh, for one meal in a fine restaurant. And so. Weeks ago, here in town, you could have bought lamb really cheap. Mine brought about a buck a pound. And so, that was at auction, though. Yeah, in here. I, that's my second year that happened, so I guess it's never going to happen. Yeah. I, I lamb late, and then I sell late. And well, and I noticed at uh, Walmart that there's American lamb. Superior is put in, Amer is put in American lamb in there. Well, sometimes it's American. It sometimes. says American. Yeah, yeah, right. That, okay, you said that. I didn't. Well, I always <laughs> look and wonder, and it says right off. Right. The yeah. American, but I. Yeah. Um, it because I don't think right. it's American. But the idea that they've got that they've got that market is a good sign, I think, for the for the um, sheep industry too. Our Smith store handles some lamb, not a lot, but they've had. Well, but that's an interesting thing, though, because um, when but you all will recall the um, uh, country of origin labeling, uh, all of that. Well, when they were having that big um, WTO battle and everything about that, and I was at this is when Safeway, you still had a Safeway here, we had a Safeway in um, Casper near our house and stuff. And they had this grass fed Australian lamb, and it was like half the price of um, American, um, not lamb, uh, uh, Australian beef, of the beef. And I thought, why, are, why don't they care? Why doesn't the cattle industry care about this? And so I asked one of my producers who produces both lamb and um, uh, beef, and he looked at me really funny. 
And I was like, what? He goes, I never go in a grocery store and look at the meat counter. <laughs> I eat my own meat. I'm like, well, you should <laughs> to see what's there, you know? Um, and because I, my, I got that from my dad. My dad, no matter where he was in the world, had to go into a grocery store and he would look at everything. And so that's what I do is I go in and I always go to the meat counter and see what cuts they're um, offering and, and everything. And I was in uh, Virginia and uh, they had a meat counter, uh, you know, fresh display meat counter, maybe this wide. And a, by half of it was lamb snack. I was like, wow, that's interesting. So you know, they were getting $35 a, um, a plate for lamb snack in a restaurant. So, so, yeah. so when you say a lot of times it's from direct to, uh, from consumers or to consumers, are you talking on the hook or? Um, no, it would be like they would buy, yeah, they would buy and, the and it would go to the process. Oh, okay. yeah. Or like a restaurant will come in and say, this is very, com this is very common in, um, in um, Sheridan. Market there, and they they go and they buy the lamb. Mm -hmm. and the same thing down in um, Casper. Uh, now, like one of the meat markets there, they do they 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 bring it up that it's a tradition, but they they don't get it directly. But some of them will get buy the animal and, and process it, not process it, but the carcass and cut the carcass. Yeah, see, that's what I mean. I think that we, the owner of the market, at the processor, and they would like to check there. And right. And you'll see also at um, farmers markets, now you see more of the um, of producers come in with their product. And with your USDA facility here, that's gonna help a lot. So, uh, and this meat processing initiative um, that is, um, that they seem to be having some struggle with at the Ag Committee, um, the, the uh, that, what that would do is provide up to a million dollars in loans, grants, uh, and other efforts for both uh, to help with infrastructure, um, uh, help with marketing, um, and, and everything. And I'm happy to share that if anybody wants a copy of that, I'm happy with it. But I think it's really important because it, it helps our businesses in Wyoming meet a Wyoming you know, not just in Wyoming need, but elsewhere too, in the USDA, they can go anywhere. And so this is something that I have this sort of dream about, is that we can market. So um, in France, every year they have the Beaujolais wine. That's the new wine, a new season of wine every year. And it's a big deal. And you go to any French restaurant in the world, and when Beaujolais wine is comes out, they have big, uh, they imagine. They have menus that go with it. They have all kinds of celebrations. Why can't we do that with Wyoming lamb? I know we can't supply it year round, but why not make it something so special that people look forward to? It's Wyoming lamb time, and you know. So you know, and I think something like this meat initiative, meat processing initiative, can could help um, you know drive that kind of a marketing um, thing. So uh, do I have to go? But anyway, that, those are my ideas. These are the things that I think about. Any other questions? With your last statement here, that we can't supply year round. Yeah. I think that's wrong. Do you think that's wrong? If, if we had a place to go with it, we could figure out how to supply it. Right. Well, see, I believe that's true. So I believe that's true, but I've always been told, though, we can't do that. But okay, so that's really good because. Like, um, I guess it depends on how big a quantity right. you're talking about. Right. Well, and for a instance, quantity, we could do it year round. Yeah. In um, so we had this uh, delegation from Taiwan that came out here um, to, and we were very fortunate to be included on this. And it was it was just a really wonderful tour. They came out. And they um, they wanted to look at where our animals were grown because there's been some beef that has gone to Taiwan. And uh, 
And so um, we did this tour and it, we on the Warren Ranch down outside of Cheyenne. And they, they said it was like a safari because it was in like October and we're driving along and there's an antelope here and then this guy goes by in a truck and he has a gigantic um, bull elk in the back of the truck. <laughs> you know, and stuff. And they were so excited about this. And then we, at the end, we came up over this hill and there are all these sheep that were being driven down across the um, thing. It was just wonderful. It was a beautiful day and they were like, they're so happy, the animals are so happy. And of course, in, China, in the Asian countries, they think that everything is Yellowstone. You know, they just, that, um, so this is a different, when they think of Wyoming, they just think Yellowstone. Um, so this was a little bit different, but um, they were very excited about it. They really wanted, a, they loved the idea of Wyoming. They loved the idea of the West. Um, but New, Z New Zealand got in there years ago when they lost their subsidies and had to find markets. They got in there years ago and they paid no tariffs at all on their products. They can send in bone in, they can send in boneless, everybody else, bone in, 35% tax. And, um, uh, is it 35%? Um, might be 15, uh, because I was thinking, we're already at a 30% in, um, we're 30% higher in cost than they are. And so you add on to that, um, yeah, it's about a 35, it comes to, you know, it's just, if it's bone in, it's just impossible to get the product there in a cost effective manner. Um, but the only way would be to develop a, um, a uh, bilateral trade agreement, but that's not gonna happen now. Um, it may have happened, because it is it's a different administration, but um, it, having a, a uh, bilateral with Taiwan, trade agreement with Taiwan would really make China mad. And so I don't see us at, at actually pursuing that. So, and the only way to get that, the only way to change their rules, because that's their agreement with um, New Zealand is to get a bilateral trade agreement. I just don't see that happening. So we lost an opportunity to be able to send our land. But we could have done it. We could have sent, sent Wyoming lamb there, which would help. Because um, the thing is, in, in um, China, they lamb is a winter dish. It's warm, family, you know, there's a real connotation about it. So they eat it in the winter time. Um, and so, you know, and we tend to eat it more in the spring, um, I think, but overall. And I think if we could find the markets, then you would have that. So, okay. Well, that, see, that's really good information for me to have. I'm not, no one's ever really explained that to me, so we can work on that. But we also have to have the infrastructure to be able to do it, right? So, and that's what this NEAT initiative could help us um, to really promote Wyoming products. I think that's really important. The quantity one. We just need to find the markets. And you know, I tend to think that um, uh, really, if you're gonna provide government help, the best place to provide it is through, um, is through your promotion and marketing. And I'll tell you, um, New Zealand, for instance, their producers get no federal subsidy, but boy, do they subsidize the marketing, right? They've got, they've got offices in um, Brussels and in the US, and Lord knows where else to be able to keep those markets um, satisfied. Well, you know, that's a government assistance. And you, like, I worked with, um, with the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture and they would um, attend the food shows worldwide um, where they could um, promote American products. And you'd go and you'd have maybe a 10 or $15,000 booth which seems like a lot of money, 
but then you'd be up against the Europeans and it says fifty or sixty thousand dollars, and it just would make us look puny, you know. And uh, but those are all those those things are all subsidized. So those marketing efforts. So, and that's what the marketing access program, ASI is involved in the marketing market access programs. So that's what those USDA programs are designed to do to help you find. Okay, well, we went way past. I didn't expect it to go there. Thank you, Amy. I hope it was worthwhile. Thank you. Oh, and 